Hello, welcome to Morning Manor, June the 8th, 2021. Let us bow our heads for prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you continue to teach us day by day so that we might understand those things that you have in mind for us and that we might grow according to your will. We ask, Lord, that you will continue to fill us with understanding, that we will indeed be prepared for that time which is soon to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our subject today is making an image to the beast. As I said before, June the 8th, 2021, and the subject, making an image to the beast. And we're still taking these subjects from Bible readings for the home circle, published in 1889. Making an image to the beast. And of course, this is the prophecy of Revelation chapter 13. First question. When was the papal head of the first beast of Revelation 13 wounded? In 1793 through 1798 by the French Revolution and the temporary overthrow of the papacy in the latter year. That was when this was done. The record says it was in 1798. Next question. What did the prophet see coming up at this time? Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Notice one of our commentators, Mr. Wesley, in his notes on Revelation 13, written in 1754, says that the two-horned beast, he's not yet come, though he cannot be far off, for he is to appear at the end of the 42 months of the first beast. The previous beast came up out of the sea, which indicates its rise among the peoples and nations of the world, then in existence. While this one comes up out of the earth, this would indicate that the latter beast would arise where there was not before any peoples and multitudes and nations and towns. In 1798, when the papal hour power received its deadly wound, the government of the United States, located in the Western continent, was the only great and independent nation then coming into prominence in territory not previously occupied by peoples, multitudes, and nations. Only nine years preceding this, in 1789, the United States adopted its national constitution. It is within the territory of the United States, therefore, that we may look, according to the prophecy, for an ecclesiastic movement to arise and exercise a dominating power and control, not only in the civil government of this country, but also in the other nations of the whole world as well. Question. What is the character of this new power? Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11 says, He had two horns like a lamb. Notice that the Pilgrim Fathers were the vanguard of a great multitude of Protestants who, when persecuted and outlawed in the lands of their birth, sought refuge in the New World, where they developed rapidly under the protection of a government founded on the great Christian principle of civil and religious freedom. The two horns may well symbolize these two fundamental principles. Next question. Notwithstanding the lamb-like appearance of this power, what is it ultimately to do? Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11 says, And he spake as a dragon. Now that is incredible. Notice that the voice of the dragon is the voice of intolerance and persecution. This indicates that the ecclesiastical development dealt with in this prophecy Obtaining a foothold for its initial power and influence in the government of the United States will pre repudiate the mild and lamb-like principles of civil and religious liberty and become like the beast before it, a worldwide persecuting power. This is why in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20, it is called the false prophet. Born of the Reformation, it will repudiate Reformation principles. Next question. How much power will the beast exercise? 
Revelation 13 and verse 12 says, And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Now the first beast before him was Papal Rome, and it exercised the power of persecuting and putting to death all who differed from it in religious matters. The only way the earth can be made to worship is by causing work to cease on it through voluntary or enforced rest or Sabbath keeping. For as long as she, the land, lay desolate, she kept Sabbath. Enforced Sunday observance is evidently implied here. Next question. What means will be employed to lead the people back into the false worship? Revelation chapter 13 and verse 14 says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So now there will be trickery and miracles and all kinds of things that will attempt to cause people to turn from the worship of the true Sabbath back to the Sabbath of error. Question. What will this power propose that the people shall do? Revelation chapter 13 and verse 14, the last part says, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. Notice, the beast which had the wound by a sword, and it did live, is the papacy. That was a church dominating the civil power. In other words, it was a union of church and state and enforced its religious dogmas by the civil power under pain of confiscation of goods, imprisonment, and death. An image to this beast will be another ecclesiastical organization clothed with civil power, another union of church and state to enforce religious dogmas by law. Question. Is there any evidence that such an image will be made? Notice this. Large and influential organizations such as the National Reform Association, the International Reform Bureau, the Lord's Day Alliance of the United States, and the Federal Council of the Churches of Christ in America have been formed by professed Protestants and for years have been persistently working to that end. Many Roman Catholic societies recently formed in the United States, such as the Knights of Columbus and America's Federation of Catholic Societies, are looking to a like end, that of making America Catholic. Question. What, according to its constitution, is the avowed object of the National Reform Association? Notice, according to Article 2 of the Constitution, to secure such an amendment to the Constitution of the United States as shall indicate that this is a Christian nation and place all the Christian laws, institutions, and usages of the government on an undeniable legal basis in the fundamental law of the land. So notice, upon the question of making this a Christian nation, Bishop Earl Cranston of the Methodist Episcopal Church is an address in an address delivered in Foundry Methodist Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. on March the 13th, 1910, made the following observation, quote, Suppose observation. This were to be declared a Christian nation by a constitutional interpretation to that effect. What would that mean? Which of the two contending divisions of Christianity would be the word Christian indicate? The Protestant idea, of course, for under our system, majorities rule, and the majority of Americans are Protestants. Very well. But suppose that by the addition of certain contiguous territory, with 12 or more million of Roman Catholics, the annexation of a few more islands, with half as many more, and the same rate of immigration as now, the majority, that the reigning Pope would assume control of legislation and government, he would say with all confidence and consistency, this is a Christian nation. It was so claimed from the beginning and so declared many years ago. 
A majority defined then what Christianity was. The majority will define now what Christianity is and is to be. That majority would be controlled by the Pope. The National Reformers, in their attempts to justify the legal establishment of Christianity as the national religion, have erroneously declared that the statement of Justice Brewer of the Supreme Court of the United States in 1892, that this is a Christian nation, is a decision of the court, whereas it was only a statement in the argument leading up to the decision of the court. In a sermon at the Centenary of the Establishment of the Roman Catholic Hierarchy in the United States, in 1889, Archbishop Ireland said, Our work is to make America Catholic. Our Christ shall be God with it, and our hearts shall leap with crusader enthusiasm. The theory of the national reformers is thus expressed. Every government, by equitable laws, is a government of God. A republic thus governed is of him, and is as truly and really a theocracy as the Commonwealth of Israel. And of course, you'll find that in the National Reform Convention, page 28. So notice now, way back there, 1888, 1889, all the way through, they have been moving in this direction, attempting to establish a constitutional government of Christianity in the United States of America. And that is what has been established back then. They have been working on that all the way through. And they're still working on it now. Question. How does this association regard the Catholic Church on this point? Now notice this, and you're going to find this really interesting. You'll find this in the Christian Statesman, December the 11th, 1884. And that is, of course, the official organ of the National Reform Association. Listen to this. We cordially, gladly recognize the fact that in South American republics, in France, and other European countries in Roman Catholic countries, are the recognized advocates of national Christianity, and stand opposed to all the proposals of secularism. Whenever they are willing to cooperate in resisting the progress of political atheism, we will gladly join hands with them in a world's conference for the promotion of national Christianity, which ought to be held at no distant day. Many countries could be represented only by Roman Catholics. So they, in other words, they're saying, as long as the Catholics are going to come together and object to the secularism that finds itself in so many countries in the world, we will gladly join hands with them, says the Protestants. And of course, that is found in the Christian Statesman, December the 11th, 1884. And of course, the Christian Statesman is the official organ of the National Reform Association. So notice now, in this particular period of time, we see the coming together of Catholicism and Protestantism in a serious manner. And their joint intention is to turn the United States of America into a Christian nation. Next question. What has the Pope commanded all Catholics to do? We're looking at the encyclical of Pope Leo XIII. November the 1st, 1885 says this, First and foremost, it is the duty of all Catholics worthy of the name and wishful to be known as most loving children of the Church to endeavor to bring back all civil society to the pattern and form of Christianity which we have described. So in other words, they're going to bring it all together. They're going to bring all Christians together. It doesn't matter where you are, Protestant or Catholic, you're all coming together. Notice the prophecy says that this power will make an image to the papacy. In the days of Constantine and his successors, the church made one of the civil power to carry out her, own, her aims. Through this means, the papacy was developed. In our day, the same theory is advocated. And prominent men in the nation, in both church and state, are doing all they can to bring about the same result, which, when their work is completed, cannot fail to fulfill the specifications of the prophecy. The climax will be an image of the papacy. Next question. What is the object of International Reform Bureau? 
Now we're going to take a look at the history of the International Reform Bureau and see what that says. On page two, it says this. The Reform Bureau is the first Christian lobby established at our national capital to speak to government in behalf of all denominations. In other words now, all of the denominations are coming together. And this is a serious matter. Because this is, goes all the way back to the 1800s. But they're coming together back then. They're not waiting on, at some point in the future. Back then. All together. Notice that the securing of the compulsory Sunday legislation is one of the chief objects of this and other organizations. And you will be able to find that in the word going back in all of the documents that they have been using. So today, this is where we stand. And we find ourselves together on all levels of community. The Catholics and the Protestants coming together. They're making an image to the beast. The kind of government that the, the, the beast originally had. The inquisitorial kind of punishments. The enforced worship. Not just a day of worship enforced in Sunday, but a way of worship is also enforced. And all of the denominations are coming together. They've decided that the only way that they're going to succeed in doing what they want done is to come together in unity. And they, what they want to do is to turn the entire nation and the rest of the world into a Christian nation and a global Christian world. In order to accomplish this, they've decided that they must work together. And this is something that they want to do and have been doing consistently. Remember how we started out? Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lab. And he spake as a dragon. This is a transformation from the lamb-likeness, the religious freedom that existed to the point where he ultimately begins to speak as only the dragon speaks. Enforcing worship. And as, as I said before, this will not only mean the enforcing of a day of worship, but it will also mean the enforcement of a way of worship. The acceptance of the papacy as the head of the church. The one that creates the environment that allows for all the rest of Christian or so-called apostate Christianity to exist. You and I have been warned concerning this for some time. And we want you to know this evening, this morning, that this has been on the books for a while. God in his mercy has held back all of the enforcement so that you and I might have an opportunity to learn and understand the truth and so that we might make the right choices and be obedient to the cause that he had caused us to obey. Today we find ourselves coming to the end of that probationary period. And we need to understand how important this is. For God continues to guide us and to give us the faith that is necessary so that we might walk according to his will and be obedient to his cause. Today God is calling you and he's calling me. He desires that we must be obedient to his cause. That the image to the beast and the governmental system or the image of the beast will not be deceptive, but that we will be able to stand firm and unmoved, following the truth as it is found in God's word, obedient to all of the things that he has instructed us to do, so that we might walk according to his will and be obedient to his cause. Remember what I read earlier? The Pilgrim Fathers were the vanguard of the great multitude of Protestants who, when persecuted and outlawed in the lands of their birth, sought refuge in the New World, where they developed rapidly under the protection of a government founded in the great Christian principles of civil and religious freedom. That was what America started out as. But ultimately, she begins to speak as a dragon. Now, the voice of the dragon is the voice of intolerance and persecution. This indicates that the ecclesiastical development dealt with in this prophecy, obtaining a foothold for its faith, initial power and influence in the government of the United States, will repudiate the mild 
and lamb-like principles of civil and religious liberty had become, like the beast before it, a worldwide persecuting power. This is why, in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20, it is called the false prophet. God is calling you today, calling you to be obedient to his cause, calling you to be obedient to his truth. Are you going to respond? Are you going to say, yes, Lord, I come with humility and repentance? Why don't you do that today? We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the kindness that you've shown us. We thank you for the warnings that you have given. We thank you for all of the love that you have expressed in every detail. And we ask that you would be with us today as we go forward, as we make our decisions to walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This has been Morning Manor, June the 8th, 2021.